So Aristotle's four causes are four explanations that help us understand what a changing living thing is. So when you ask questions like, who am I? What is an acorn? Or what is a dog? These are all basic metaphysical questions about what a thing is, and Aristotle's four causes are essential to answering these questions well. So look at the screen, the four definitions here. And uh, we're going to apply the four causes to the Statue of Liberty to learn about them. Now, technically, you're not supposed to apply the four causes to non-living things, but we will for the sake of learning them. Okay? So the material causes is the physical stuff out of which something is made. So the material cause of the Statue of Liberty is copper and iron and so on. The efficient cause is the force that precedes the thing and pushes it into existence. So the Statue of Liberty, its efficient cause is construction workers, you know, people pounding on metal and so on. The formal cause is the form, function, or essence of a thing. It's that which it strives to be. It's what a thing does when it's flourishing. So the Statue of Liberty, its formal cause is Lady Liberty. Okay, and you can see a little picture of her there. The final cause is what the thing exists for the sake of. It's the ultimate purpose of the object. So the purpose of the Statue of Liberty, the final cause, is perhaps to celebrate freedom. Okay. So now let's do a little activity before we get into more depth into these four causes. And this activity asks you to identify f the four causes for each of these four things. And the first one is an acorn. Okay, so the material cause of the acorn is what it's made of, and that's protein, carbs, calcium, and so on. The efficient cause is what pushes it into existence, and that's the tree, the water, the soil, the sunlight, and so on. The formal cause, what it's striving to be, is an acorn tree. And notice all living things have something they're striving to be. Now, they aren't consciously striving to be something, right? Rather, you could think of it as what's in their blueprint or DNA or genetic code. The acorn is on the path of acorn treeness, and when it actualizes its potential within itself, it will become an acorn tree that produces more acorns. And so that's what we mean by the formal cause. The final cause is the ultimate purpose for which it exists, and in this case, um, the final cause is perhaps an acorn tree that reproduces. Right? Now, an acorn tree is not necessarily conscious of its final cause, though. There doesn't have to be a mind to give the acorn a purpose or final cause. Rather, the final cause of the acorn describes the resourcefulness of acorns and the pattern of development that they naturally follow. Certainly, one could adopt the final cause to a teleological or religion-based system, um, you know, and say God made this for this purpose. Okay? But you can also adopt the four causes to a naturalistic and atheistic perspective. So in naturalism, the formal and final causes often merge into what a thing does well and how it reproduces itself. Okay. All right, let's look at the second one, a non-living thing again. And this is a poem. Okay, here's what I have. You might have something slightly different, and that's okay. okay. The material cause is the paper and the ink. The efficient cause is the pencil and the poet. The formal cause, perhaps, is an expression of an idea or feeling. And the final cause is to inspire, to reflect, and so on. Let's do the next one, the human, okay? A human being. The material cause, and again, you might have something a little different as long as it's similar. The material cause is water and carbon. The efficient cause is my parents. The formal cause, well, what is it? What do, you know, acorns become acorn trees and human babies become human adults. So what are they developing as they become human adults? Well, I would say they're developing their rationality if they're developing well. Right? Their social skills, their emotional uh, maturity, and so on. So just as, and, and also just as trees have common formal causes, so they might have unique ones. So for example, an oak tree is similar to a pecan tree, but they also have different potentialities actualized. And so it is with us humans. Right? So you might have the potential to be a great musician, and you actualize that. And I have the potential to be a great sumo wrestler, and I actualize that. <laughs> we are actualizing similar things, but also different things, things unique to each one of us. So the formal cause might have things in common and things different. Anyway, with a human being, the final cause perhaps is to flourish and reproduce in an adult form. For the religious-minded, the final cause might be, you know, heaven or to please God or to become the person you were meant to be. For the atheist, the final cause might be self-actualization, to actualize your potential. Let's do one last one. You might get something different again, but consciousness. The material cause is what is made of. It's the physical brain, the neurons. The efficient cause is what pushes consciousness into existence. And I would say the efficient cause is the polarization of the neural network. The formal cause 
is what it's striving to be, so to speak. And I think perhaps the formal cause is awareness, just being aware. It's the formal cause is something it's like to be me and something it's like to be you. It's awareness. And then the final cause, well, um, there's many possibilities from an evolutionary perspective. Perhaps it gives rise to a sort of freedom or survival advantage or reproduction advantage or some sort of knowledge that's valuable. Okay, so we've tried to apply these four causes. Let's t reflect on why they're valuable now. Okay. First, notice that such an analysis helps you think about personal identity. So you can be you without the material which constitutes you. So in 10 years, you'll be made of mostly new material. So you aren't just your material cause. Um, you are you even if your parents die. So you're not just your efficient cause. However, could you be you without the organization's subconscious goals that characterize your life, the formal and final causes? And exploring this deep question can help you clarify what it is to be you. Okay, so thinking about the four causes can also help us see why Aristotle would reject materialism. A blob of matter is not a thing until it has form. It's pure potentiality or energy. A fish is not a fish because of its physical components, since different fish have different physical components. Okay, Rather, a fish is a fish because of its organization, its formal and final causes. So explaining what a thing is made of doesn't fully explain that thing one must also speak of its form and function. Something to ponder. Um, Rupert Sheldrake is a modern scientist who has created a theory called morphic resonance. And if you check out this theory, it kind of goes perhaps a little beyond what Aristotle says, but it's a very interesting theory that kind of resurrects the formal cause in a, a very interesting way. But he's not um, very popular among most scientists, I guess you could say. <laughs> okay, so anyway, the four causes can help us also discover the difference between a thing's essential and accidental properties. The accidental properties of a thing are those that it could lose and still be that thing. So, for example, you could grow taller and heavier and still be you, so height and weight are not essential to your identity. You could also be tanner than you currently are, so color is not an essential property. Um, and it's interesting to go down the list and think of what is essential to you, right? So let's conclude here. The four causes gives you the tools you need to fully explain why a thing is what it is. Explaining just one of the causes simply doesn't give you full understanding. You need all four. And the four causes then is like this logical tool. It's a way of thinking about things, especially living things, that you should put into your logical toolkit. So when some philosopher irritates you by asking you, what makes you you, <laughs> you can respond by saying, well, let's break it down into four parts, right? And then analyze it from those four perspectives. Um, anyway, understanding these four causes can help you also understand aspects of Aristotle's really influential philosophy, including his idea that consciousness seems to be neither physical nor completely non-physical. Okay. Notice, too, that this one concept from Aristotle gives us some insight into how his brilliant mind worked. In this case, we see his power of analysis, his ability to break a difficult question into parts, to capture the four approaches we use to describe what a thing is. And through this, through the four causes, we can clarify our thinking on issues, right? Even if we disagree with Aristotle about, you know, what the mind is and so on, we can at least clarify our thinking. And this clarification of thought is an important part of philosophy. So this is one of many reasons why this Aristotle guy is considered to be one of the most influential thinkers in history. Thanks.